So welcome and hello, this is Terrence Barkin from the Graphene Council. We are hosting today's webinar on graphene and composite materials. We're focused on using graphene materials and composites and any of the potential supply chain obstacles that might exist for that, which either could be technical or business issues. We want to talk about the range of composite materials that graphene might be used to enhance. And we want to get feedback from the audience about um, issues that you might be facing or questions that you might have about the use of these materials. We have two additional excellent speakers that will be working with us today. That includes James Baker from the Graphene Engineering and Innovation Center at the University of Manchester in the UK, and Jason Gibson from Composites One. So first, let me just introduce you and tell you a little bit about the Graphene Council. The Graphene Council uh, was formed in 2013, and today we are by far the largest largest community for those who are interested in the use of graphene materials. We reach more than 25,000 material scientists worldwide. And through strategic partnerships with organizations like the Society of Plastics Engineers, the American Composite Manufacturers Association, Composites World, JEC, and others, we reach literally hundreds of thousands of engineers around the world who are interested in and want to learn more about graphene, and in particular, graphene's use in composites. Member organizations in the Graphene Council range in the full spectrum from graphite producers, graphite miners, to pr uh, graphene producing companies, intermediary companies that do functionalization or some other value add services with graphene materials, companies that distribute resin systems like Composites One, who we're very pleased to have as a partner on this webinar, and other organizations, as well as end users um, one of the most notable and, and public you'll see there is Ford Motor Company, um, who is using graphene in production vehicles. And so we really have the full ecosystem in the Graphene Council, and we believe that's one of our strengths, is to be able to pull together all of these parties, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So right now, what I'd like to do is introduce James Baker. As I mentioned, he directs what is called Graphene at Manchester, which is an uh, incredible initiative um, undertaken by the city and the university to really make Manchester, UK, a center of graphene development. And so, James, if uh, if you're with us, can you um, can you unmute yourself and and uh, we'll go to share your presentation slides. Thank you, uh, Terence, and good morning, everybody in America, and good afternoon from the UK. Hopefully, you will be able to see my slides. So, so thank you for that introduction, Terence, and welcome, welcome everybody. So I just want to briefly tell an update in terms of graphene, you know, in terms of its journey from its discovery in 2004 by two scientists in Manchester, driven by curiosity. I'm sure you've all heard this story, taking sticky tape and graphite, peel that many times, you can get down to a single atomic layer of carbon or graphene. Um, so what? They then went through a period of understanding that discovery, which led to the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010. And then since that day, there's been a lot of activity around understanding and applying how you might use this, this graphene material um, in, in the future. What I really want to focus on for this presentation, though, is 16 years since that discovery in 2004, bringing through to today, 2020, you're seeing a real explosion now in terms of companies exploring how they might use this graphene in their various products and applications. And I really do believe now is a time where increasingly you can start to see the impact of new materials like graphene. And I say like graphene, and I'm sure Terence may cover this, is there are many different forms of graphene from single layer to few layer to nano platelets. And actually, indeed, there are actually over 100 other two-dimensional materials being discovered post-graphene. And indeed, in the science area, they're now making stacks of multifunctional heterostructures. So for me, this is about the application of advanced materials. And I just want to give a brief update in terms of where we are and what the opportunity is for companies to engage and how we're approaching this collaboration at the University of Manchester. So Terence mentioned earlier Ford, but again, from our estimates, we believe today there are over 1 million cars on the road 
with graphene enhanced foam in the engine bay. So again, this is not just a small number, a significant number of road vehicles with graphene involved in them. Another quick case study looked at mobile phones and today we estimate around 21 million mobile phones are in the marketplace with graphene supporting the phones around keeping them cool. It's a long way away from the early days where people saw bendy flexible phones that you stitch into your skin but it's a simple thermal management layer inside the phone to keep them cool to improve the efficiency but already you're seeing a significant number of product in the marketplace and in sale and I think as we go through 2020 and into 2021 you'll see an increasing number of products hitting the marketplace where graphene is now being talked in terms of performance, not just in terms of a marketing or containing graphene for, for PR or for marketing purposes. Increasingly, you're seeing people using graphene for a significant productivity, performance, or product benefit that discriminates it in the marketplace. So in Manchester, in the UK, we still have um, a number of scientists working not just on graphene, but on a whole series of 2D materials, over 100 different 2D materials now being studied. We have the 61 million pound National Graphene Institute. As Terence introduced earlier, we have the 60 million pound Graphene Engineering Innovation Center. The National Graphene Institute is at the center of Manchester, very much about bringing together the multidisciplinary science from across the university, but working in partnership with industry, but really studying the fundamentals of that science down at that nano layer, down that single layer, and indeed on the first floor of the Institute, if you pass by, you'll actually see machines in there where they're now manufacturing at device level, heterostructures of 2D materials, just to generate the next form of papers, publications, and science coming out of the university. However, from my perspective, from industry, the science is great, but how do we translate that science into product and application? And any of those who have done any studies of carbon fiber or silicon has probably seen that it takes many years, if not tens of years, from the university labs into the marketplace. So at Manchester, we've been looking around not just the technology model, but the whole business and innovation model. How do we turn a problem, an industry challenge, an industry um, objective, and rapidly produce a component which we can test, we can validate, and using principles probably originally done around DARPA for those in the US around this whole grand challenge and rapid what I would call make or break. Let's make something, make it repeatably, or fail, fast learn, and move on. So in order to achieve that at Manchester, we were fortunate to have 60 million pounds for a second facility called the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center. Very much built in that principle of make or break. It's factory-like pilot production and scale up, but the ability to do this very rapid prototyping, not just of the 2D materials, but of a whole series of areas from composites through to printed electronics, through to new energy, through to membranes and coatings, production of, of the material. And core to that is understanding what we've got and how we take that forward, why it works or why it doesn't work, so we can learn and we can move on. So from my perspective, this is a very exciting time for being involved with graphene. To date in Manchester, we have over 150 industrial partners. The Graphene Engineering Innovation Center opened just over one year ago. Unfortunately, we are not operational as a, fa as a facility at the moment on lockdown, but the team are working at home, um, home working, and we're running a series of seminars. So really pleased to support Terence and the Graphene Council here today and over the next weeks we'll be running our own seminars. This is a great time to understand what graphene might do for your particular market, your area, your particular application or product. So what are the opportunities for graphene? Now graphene is a material and 
to an extent, there is still an element using the Gartner hype cycle of a technology push activity. But I think we are seeing over the last year, and I think supported by the work that the Graphene Council and the partners are going to be talking around today, we're starting to see that increased pull in terms of challenges that need to be solved and how graphene and 2D materials might support or, or help in achieving those challenges or targets. A great example when we're talking around composites is that of light weighting. If we could take out structure, weight, for example, out of a component on an aircraft, we could reduce cure time, we could reduce manufacturing cost, improve productivity, but also by reducing weight of the structure, can we reduce fuel emissions and increase the range of those platforms? So I see graphene increasingly taking a key part in terms of supporting light weighting, both in terms of composites, but also in terms of, for example, coatings, thermal management or de-icing, and ultimately in aerospace, maybe even achieving something like lightning strike protection. So huge areas where graphene can support composites, can support the light weighting agenda. Another area of interest is that around reinforcement, everything from concrete through to roads, through to plastics and rubbers. And again, in the UK, we are working with Highways England, who are responsible for the road network, looking about how we might reinforce um, roads to make them both tougher, but also flexible enough to stop damage in ice or in heat that can be the cause of potholes. So again, reinforcement, an area of everything from plastics through to rubbers, through to, through to, to metal matrices being a big opportunity. Energy storage, again, from batteries through to new supercapacitors, through to hybrid structures where we might have, for example, a battery contained into a structure supplemented by a supercapacitor being a hybrid solution of the future that might meet some of our global challenges around move to carbon neutral. A particular exciting area for me is that of filtration and separations. So everything from anti-corrosion coatings through to a membrane that you could create that could take dirty, contaminated water through a graphene membrane into drinking water and some great opportunity around that area. Finally, an area that for me graphene can play a key part is that of multifunctionality. An area with my background of aerospace and defense, if you can achieve more than one of those functions, for example, taking out weight, but also improving thermal management, using the Ford example, also having flame retardancy and vibration or noise reduction, suddenly you get a product that has many applications and potential in the marketplace. And there's much more applications I could talk about but there's not time to on this seminar today. So what I wanted to briefly just leave you with was, for me, a route map of where graphene started in 2004 through to what we'll see increasingly in the future. What I encourage you all to think about through seminars like today in terms of not just the science, but how we build the whole supply chain of material, product and application and traditionally, if we look at this on a two axis scale, on the bottom axis, X axis, we have TRL or technology readiness level from one to nine. On the vertical axis, I often plot something called system readiness level. Other people might call this manufacturing readiness level. Others may call it customer readiness level. But typically we go from bottom left, TRL one, a new discovery, a new material, through to top right, where we have products in the marketplace creating value. But that journey can take tens, if not many tens of years. So what we're trying to do with Manchester, but working with partners like the Graphene Council, working with material suppliers, material supply chain, end users, we're still doing the science that universities are great at, but through the NGI, we're starting to push that boundary from the science 
into concepts, but also addressing things like standards, measurement, health and safety, toxicology, key areas that need to be addressed if we are going to achieve products in the marketplace. The Geek is in the classic Valley of Death area, but core to all this collaboration is collaboration with industry. And why I'm keen to support events like this webinar and working with the Graphene Council about how we bring all this together in a unique and different way. And just to finish my presentation, if we do this well and we can build a supply chain, we can bring together the ecosystem of end users, material suppliers, but also in terms of investors, in terms of finance, in terms of bright people, we're looking to create what we're calling the start of Graphene City. Hope that was useful as an introduction and happy to take questions at the end when um, Terence um, reintroduces at the end. Thank you. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you, James. I really appreciate that. Um, and it's obvious why we wanted to have you engage in this. And, and from the Graphene Council's perspective, we, we greatly value the, um, the collaboration that we have with uh, the Geek and with the University of Manchester uh, because it takes the entire ecosystem working together to, uh, to make this happen, as you say, in a short period of time. Okay, so let me briefly go through this. Um, as James alluded to, there are different types of graphene materials. Um, the scientific definition of graphene is a single atomic layer, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, characterization of the material and definitions, um, but the ISO standard um, allows for up to 10 layers of carbon, which is still just a few nanometers in thickness. And then I just want to emphasize that for commercial purposes, there is material that has more than 10 layers of carbon that has, that has functionality to it. Um, and it has usefulness. And so we, we can get into those discussions about where the cutoff actually is. But from a commercial point of view, what, it, what really matters is how the material performs um, in, in juxtaposition to what we're trying to achieve. So the, the reason why you know, graphene has just attracted so much attention over the last 15 years is because, and again, as James has stated, it has some really amazing properties. But what's not to be forgotten here is that it doesn't impart just one of these at a, at a time when it's used in uh, different applications. It is often adding multiple uh, benefits at the same time, which makes it really quite unique as a material. In, in most cases, when you're adding uh, some kind of um, additive uh, to achieve an improvement in one performance factor, you have a trade-off and you have to su sacrifice something. And many times with graphene, that's not the case. You know, for example, in elastomers and rubber, the trade-off is typically if you want more traction, you have greater wear, it becomes a softer rubber. And if you want to have uh, better wear, you make a harder uh, material that doesn't wear as much, but you lose traction. And we've seen um, in many applications, whether it be in, uh, in footwear or whether it be in road tires, uh, that graphene has broken that law that you have this trade-off. So you can get both better traction and improved wear at the same time, which is just phenomenal for a material like rubber, which has been around for decades, and, uh, but that dynamic has always applied. And so when we look at materials again, um, you'll hear many people talk about, well, we're offering you graphene, but the real question is what exactly is the material you have? And then it needs to be characterized and I'll let you know that we are going to be having another webinar later in the month with the National uh, Physical Laboratory out of the UK on material characterization. So that's, a, that's another important topic that we'll cover um, in a few weeks. So you have anywhere from a very sing, you know, a single layer of carbon material, which could be referred to as monolayer or sometimes called pristine graphene, to different um, numbers of layers of graphenic material. And then you also have issues of distribution so that if you receive a graphene material, um, it may be that 80% of it is between two and five layers and 20% of it's between uh, seven and 10 layers, for example. So that's, that's another nuance to the type of material you get. In addition to this, we have materials such as graphene oxide where approximately 35% of the material by weight is oxygen. You have a reduced graphene oxide. Graphene can be produced and delivered in the form of a dry powder. It could be in a solution or a solvent. 
It can be delivered as a paste. You have graphene nanoplatelets, which exceed the ISO definition of what graphene is, but they certainly have uh, value um, in applications. And then you have an additional uh, characteristic or, or um, iteration here where you have functionalized material. So there's actually material that's decorated on the surface or on the edges of the graphene flakes, for example, with other molecules or elements to give them uh, additional properties to make them adhere better or to make them disperse more easily or, or whatever the objective might be. So long story short, it is to say that, you know, graphene is not one thing, but it is many, many things. And each of these different characteristics that we've highlighted here will have an impact on how the material actually performs in a host matrix when we're talking about composites. And it's really important to understand these nuances in order for you to get the objective or the performance improvement that you're seeking. Now the Graphene Council has tracked more than 40 major vertical areas where graphene has an impact, which again is one of the reasons why this material deserves the attention that it does get from the community. And you can see that this range of um, applications are quite diverse from things like energy storage and sensors to simple mechanical improvements in materials like cement or asphalt or as a coating for steels, anti-corrosion, et cetera. So it's really a quite versatile system. And so if you're looking from an industry perspective, for example, from an aerospace perspective or an automotive industry perspective, um, you'll be looking at graphene for many different applications in your end product. So EMI shielding to light weighting, to thermal management, to the, all of the rubber products, et cetera. So it's um, quite, quite um, versatile material. And composites has come out as one of the leading applications for graphene, primarily because it can be added into resin systems, into the way that you manufacture composite parts without the requirement for specialized equipment or changing your processes. An important aspect in understanding graphene uh, is that when it is added in the form of a composite, it's often added at extremely low load factors. So this could be 1% or less, tenths of a percent by weight added into the host material. So one of the um, arguments against graphene has been that it's prohibitively expensive. But when you consider how little of it you actually need to use to drive the performance improvement, um, it changes that cost dynamic uh, dramatically. So just to run through a couple of examples, and then we'll get to, to Jason from Composites One to get his perspective as an expert on these resin systems. I just wanna show where graphene is actually being used um, in, in composites. Now, a key feature for making graphene effective in a composite is dispersion. And I just want, I'm not gonna go in detail through all of the, the channels here, and you will have a copy of these slides so you can refer to this later. But it's just to show that there are many routes to get graphene into a matrix that ends up into a composite part. Um, and this dispersion phase is where um, you really need to have good expertise with how to compound or put this material into your host matrix to make it perform. You can have really good graphene material, the material is uh, exactly what you need, but if it's not dispersed properly, you will not get the outcome uh, that you're expecting. Um, the other really interesting thing about graphene, if we look at the, the classical uh, plastics pyramid, um, is graphene can be used in, in pretty much all of the materials um, that you see listed here. So whether it be thermosets or thermoplastics, um, it can be used, uh, obviously the dispersion or the way you introduce it into the host material is gonna be different depending on the actual uh, plastic that you're using. Um, but it's an extremely wide range of materials where, uh, where graphene can be used. And for example, a very common uh, material like a PA nylon um, we've seen uh, companies, uh, multiple companies, getting uh, three to four fold, 300 to 400% improvement in, uh, in strength um, modulus by adding a very small amount of graphene to the material, which then enables you to use some of these materials in new application areas where before they weren't up to the performance specs. So that's an interesting aspect. It, it's a way of perhaps reducing cost or using a more um, uh, more manageable material. So composite applications, we've already mentioned aerospace and automotive. Sporting goods is another really interesting one in the marine sector, rubber, any kind of plastics. 
Um, graphing is used in 3D printing, including 3D printing with chopped fiber. Um, it has excellent uh, coating and barrier properties for anti-corrosive behaviors, or if you think of things like pressure vessels where you need to have really good barrier properties for gases, polymers and epoxies, and um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about fiber reinforced uh, materials, whether it be glass or whether it be carbon or even uh, basalt uh, for that matter. So why are people interested in using graphene? What is it you can get out of it? And here is a complete list of the different types of performance metrics that you can get out of graphene. And what has been interesting, um, Ford is one example, and there's a company called First Graphene, one of our members out of Australia, that has made also a graphene enhanced polyurethane um, applications. Um, the main intent for, um, in the case of Ford, was for, um, for thermal uh, improvement in the properties of the material, but they got additional benefits out of it with the anti-vibration and noise reduction, which were not expected. And in the case of the polyurethane product for the material in, uh, in the mining industry, the intent was reduced wear on the parts, but what they found is that it imparted fire retardation on the material, which was important because when they were um, working on some of this mining equipment, it's a, it's a harsh environment, you often do welding, and um, if it would come in contact with some of the plastics, it could set the gear on fire. So uh, the fire retardation was not the target performance factor, but it was one of the happy accidents that came out of using it. And it's because graphene has such multifunctionality that that occurred. And so you almost always have uh, benefits uh, from using graphene uh, there are, as opposed to the number of sacrifices made or, or degradation in performance that you want. So if you were thinking about your own particular applications, I would invite you to think, what is the key performance metric you have that you want to improve, pick that as your target, and then we would match the right type of graphene and the right type of uh, dispersion and introduction into that uh, matrix to improve that performance. But I would not ignore some of the other benefits that you are likely to get uh, by introducing graphene into that application. And so here's an example with an injection molded part, um, and we borrow the slide from the University of Manchester which shows that graphene could be introduced into this type of material. In this case, it's with a twin screw extruder. Um, and I'll just make note on the lower left-hand side where it talks about the size, the lateral size of the flakes of graphene that are used. Um, with graphene, it's really important to understand the morphology of the material you have because the, the format of the material, the shape of the material and the size of it dictates how it performs. So that's really important that we understand the type of material you're working with. The other example we've mentioned several times now is in Ford with enhanced polyurethane foams, which are used in the engine compartment. And Ford continues to look at other ways of using graphene enhanced parts to improve the product that they put on the market for their consumer. Uh, that was provided, the materials provided by XG Sciences, again, one of our uh, valued corporate members in the Graphene Council. XG also has been supplying the material to Callaway for use in golf balls, which uh, is interesting. As a golfer, I'm fascinated by this, and I've used these balls myself. So that's, to, again, to make them perform better and give them a competitive advantage in the market against other producers of golf balls. Um, this is an example of a 3D printed uh, component. That black arch is the piece that you see there. And in this case, the graphene material was provided by Versarian. Uh, one of our member companies based in the UK. And uh, what's interesting here is that this is a 3D printed composite part for use in the railway systems to support um, some of the wiring and, and such that they have. And it was chosen for its anti-corrosive behavior, right? Because it doesn't corrode, um, strength and light weightening and ease of uh, installation um, in that system. So again, when you're looking at the cost benefit analysis for graphene, I think you have to look at the entire systems like if you had a faster cure. Um, I know we're talking about composites today, but for example, graphene can uh, vastly improve the cure time for cement. And if that's the case, you have companies who are um, charged based on how long it takes for them to do a build. And so the value in adding graphene is not only in strengthening the concrete, but it improved the, the amount of time or reduced the amount of time needed for the build. And that has value. 
Uh, this is an example of a field hockey stick where graphene enhances, again, the performance. So you're getting both strength and flex into that particular piece of gear, which is the objective. You have um, in the BAC, uh, which is a custom automotive manufacturer out of the UK, which makes high performance vehicles. Um, they've gone to a 100% graphene enhanced carbon fiber reinforced body panel um, approach for this automobile. And what you're looking at is dramatically improved strength and light weighting at the same time, which obviously is uh, the key performance attribute in this particular application. And that can be applied um, as is often the case when you go from high performance vehicles into consumer, uh, into consumer vehicles especially in a period where whether you're talking about EVs, electrical vehicles where weight reduction is critical, or if you're talking about traditional combustion engines, you still want rate weight reduction for better economies. In the sporting goods sector, you have here a carbon fiber uh, bike, which, you know, this has now become old school, if you will. But if you take that same technology, you use graphene to enhance the resin system and improve the performance, you've got here a dramatic 50% improvement in fracture toughness, which is important for this type of application. It makes the bike lighter and a 70% improvement in interlaminar shear strength. Um, because of course, the, the challenge as they continually push the envelope to make these bikes lighter by reducing the amount of material used, you make them more fragile. And here's an excellent op uh, opportunity or example of making the bike more robust while making it lighter weight, which is highly attractive in that application. And so with that, I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to show you that this isn't theoretical, that graphene is being used in composites today, but it's being used by, in composites today by people who are on the leading edge and are out on that, that front frontier of uh, what we're doing with this. And now what I'd like to do, and the objective of this call and we really want your questions on this, is how do we get these performance improvements not as um, one-off examples or only from very innovative companies or on the front end, but how do we make this more mainstream? Because if you can take the entire class of composites, which competes against traditional materials like metals, and elevate its performance, and at the same time, we're putting carbon into a fixed, um, fixed end product, how do, how do we make this more mainstream? And so that's what we want to talk about. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jason Gibson from Composites One, one of our member companies and a great partner. Um, Jason, I'm going to stop my screen and see if you can um, add yours there. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that, Terrence. So as Terrence mentioned, my name is Jason Gibson. I'm the Chief Applications Engineer for Composites One. Uh, Composites One, we're the largest composite solution provider in North America. Um, I want to take this presentation and kind of break it into three segments. The first segment, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of who we are in case you're not familiar with us. The second segment, I'm going to talk about various nanoparticles we currently carry, and that's for the purpose of comparison to the graphing project that we're embarking on. And then the last section, I want to talk about this uh, graphing testing project uh, that we're going to be doing and how we hope to... Uh, you know, take the results and go to the marketplace with them. So at Composites One, we do over a billion dollars in sales revenue in North America. We have uh, 40 different stocking locations in the U.S. and Canada. In those locations, we carry over 40,000 SKUs. So that's a lot of different products. We handle everything from fiberglass to carbon fiber, air mids. If you want to talk about resins, we carry a broad range as well from polyesters, vinyl esters, epoxies, BMIs, benzoxacenes, etc. And then we also carry a lot of different prepregs throughout because we do have uh, freezer locations at a number of our facilities, as well as we have our own uh, trucking fleet with uh, some, a number of them having reefer capabilities. And we do carry aerospace specified materials as well throughout. But I think the important thing to learn from this, you know, data driven slide there of who we are is that we're uniquely positioned because of the breadth and the depth of composite materials that we carry, as well as the technical experience we've gained over the years that allows us to provide a comprehensive, integrated composite solution for all of our customer needs. So we're not just coming to the table with just a carbon fiber solution or just a prepreg solution. We can sit down with the uh, customer and listen to the issues that they're having and then develop a, a broad ranged, all inclusive, unique uh, solution to what they're requiring. So this slide shows the map of our different locations and 
If you look closely at the, uh, the different types we've got, you'll see that we've got six different AS9120 certified locations spread pretty, pretty evenly throughout the country. And then we also have 12 locations that have large freezer capacity that allows us to stock pre-pregs with um, minimal lead time and uh, no MOQs. And then a number of our locations also export to Asia, Europe, Mexico, and South America. So we do a good job of uh, just providing service to the North American industry. Now here at Composites One, we've invested through the years on being able to offer a broad base of technical support. I'm part of our advanced composites team, of which there's 14 of us. And in addition to the advanced composites team, we have a group of technical support managers that are regionally dispersed. So our advanced composites team is essentially formed of material-based experts in, and our technical support team are fundamentally process-based experts. Now there's some overlap. We certainly all have good, well-rounded knowledge of both materials and processes, but that dichotomy, that, that split allows us to offer our customers both new material innovations and uh, new processes with uh, hands-on coordination and support at the customer level. So we'll go in with our customers, we present new materials to them, and then we'll work side by side with them as they implement it into their production environment and work through any problems that pop up so that they're confident that in our partnership, they're able to be successful bringing it onto their production floor. We also offer a broad range of training um, through our Closed Mold Alliance. So the Closed Mold Alliance, we began in 2007. It's, it's essentially a combination of material manufacturers with their technical experts. We combine together to offer you know, well-rounded process and material education. Everything from demonstrations that we do at professional events like CAMEX to uh, training events that we do through IACME and others, as well as customized training solutions at the customer level. So we can brought, offer a broad range of training and support to the market industry. So at Composites One, we have extensive experience in evaluating and marketing just various nanoparticle systems. So I just wanted to take a, a brief moment and present some of the things I've run into that can be what I call process hurdles or implementation hurdles, trying to get it uh, implemented into the production floor and to our customers. So the first thing we require is that you need to have a master batch formulation. And the reason for that is we don't want to have to deal with any health, safety, and environmental issues. So we need it to be blended into a resin system or you know, heavily dosed into some type of master batch form, whether that's in the form of pellets or, or some type of a solvent-based system that you can blend into an epoxy or other resin system. Now, the next group of hurdles that I'm going to talk about are I could kind of classify as ease of implementation on the production floor. These are things that have popped up when I tried to um, present new products to customers. The first is, do you require specialty functionalization for different bases? So for instance, we had a graphing uh, provider that was very technically sound, did a good job, but every time we'd bring a new customer with their particular epoxy, it'd take them a while to custom formulate a, a functionalization for it. And that time frame of customizing the functionalization really was outside the relevant time frame of the decision-making process for the customer. When you get a customer excited about this, you only have a certain time frame to be able to get them on the hook and, and implementing in their production environment. So if you require custom functionalization, that can be a, a roadblock to being successful. It's better if you can have something that allows you to disperse properly in a broad range of different bis A's, bis F's, Novolac type epoxies. Another hurdle is, uh, do you require elevated temperatures to mix it into the system? Now this isn't a, a deal killer, but it's certainly something to take into account. You know, if a production environment is gonna implement this and you require them to have somebody come in early on the shift for a couple hours to heat up the resin and blend it in, that's certainly a, a pain point that they'll have to deal with. It doesn't mean it's a deal killer, but it certainly makes it more difficult to get them converted over to the new material. Does your material require settling or does it have settling of the particles during storage? You know, a lot of these production environments, they'll pull from a drum of epoxy and, you know, they may not run through it in a single shift. So when they come back for their next shift the next day, do they need to go and shear mix it back in? Again, not a deal killer, but another pain point that you have to get them over to be able to get it implemented in the production environment. Are there major viscosity changes with blending in your graphene or nanoparticle? Because there's a number of different processes out there that if the viscosity increases drastically, it can't be used anymore. It needs to have a low viscosity to be able to flow. And then finally, are there filtering of the particles with certain processes like infusion or resin transfer molding? And this really speaks to the dispersion of the nanoparticle. Do you have good dispersion? If you do, the inherent nanoparticle size will, will flow right through the ply stack without any issue. But if you have some conglomeration issues, those will filter out 
and you won't see the benefits of having it in there. So that's another hurdle that we you know, try to work through and understand before we implement with the customer. Now the next bullet item I have there is probably the thing I run into the most. And basically it comes down to are the benefits that you're offering with your product enough to overcome what I call the indifference factor. And what I mean by that is in reality, when you're trying to bring a customer on with a new product, someone there has to be willing to stick their neck out, whether it's an engineer or a production manager, they got to be willing to say to their company, I believe this is worth taking the risk of putting it into our production environment. So you may be able to increase tensile modulus or flex modulus by say 20%, but is that value proposition, is that uh, reward enough to justify that particular decision maker to stick his neck out and try to implement it in their production environment? So you can have a good product, but is it good enough to get the, them committed to convert? And the last one is when you, you, you know, makes sense. Is there increased cost to it? Everybody understands there's gonna be an increased cost to a nanoparticle enhancement but it can't be so great that you basically price yourself out of the marketplace. So these are just a few of the implementation hurdles we've run into in the past. Just wanna make everyone aware that this is something we take into account as we bring in new nanoparticles. So composites one, we carry a number of different nanoparticle additives, but I just wanted to take a, just a few slides to talk about four of some of the most relevant ones we've seen. Uh, I'm gonna discuss some of the appealing physical property enhancements for each one of these. And I'm doing that for the purpose of comparison because Part of my job of vetting new nanoparticles is to compare them to what we currently have and what the marketplace has to see if you know, the new enhancements are compelling enough, are they better than what's currently out there in the marketplace to justify bringing them on board and bringing them to our customer and presenting them. So the first one I wanna talk about is vertically aligned carbon nanotubes. These are grown on a substrate in a chemical vapor deposition process. They're then placed into a unidirectional prepreg and the substrate is removed. Now, this image here, this graphic representation here shows, so these circles are the carbon toes at the cross-sectional view. And then you could see the vertically lined carbon nanotubes as a, a forest, if you will, how they bridge the gap between the ply stacks. So they bridge that matrix, that resin, where it, which is typically a weak link in composites. You know, typically if a crack begins to propagate in the resin, it just zips right through the ply stacks and then you have uh, ply failure. So how this works is that if a crack begins to propagate in the resin matrix, the carbon nanotubes immediately divert the crack up into the ply stack, thereby forcing more energy to be absorbed to be able to continue the crack propagation. So as you'd expect, we see some greatly improved shear characteristics and matrix driven properties, especially in fatigue. So I just wanted to put a couple points of data up there. The first being, you know, we saw in the Tenkati TC350 system with IM7 fibers, we saw 34% improvement in interlaminar shear strength. That's pretty compelling. But even more important, we also saw 100X improvement in shear base fatigue. So that could be very compelling when we're trying to, you know, present this product to a customer. The next one I want to talk about is the Arkema Nano Strength. This is a functionalized nano copolymer chain it's got a polybutadiene center with a polymethyl methacrylate ends that allows it to bond into epoxy. So this improves toughness as well. So what I show here is uh, K1C toughness. So you can see here at 0% loading, we had a 0.88 K1C. And then if you move to different loadings, like for instance, the 5% loading of the nano strength, we show an almost doubling of the K1C toughness. And then the green bar represents the glass transition temperature. So even though we've almost doubled, the toughness, we've had very little impact for glass transition temperature. And then you could go even farther to a 10% loading and, and more than doubled with still a very minimal impact on glass transition temperature. So you can imagine how this would have a, a good value proposition for hot, wet environments, downhole applications where you want to increase the toughness of the epoxies without degrading the uh, glass transition temperature. Another good toughener out there is the Konica core shell rubber particles. They do offer nano sized particles. Um, it, it's a simple shear mix into the resin. There's no heating required. And it does have a fundamentally different way of absorbing energy. So these are copolymer spheres. And as you, if you can imagine how the crack impinging on the sphere, the sphere will then cavitate. So picture a rubber ball being pressed down. And that cavitation of that shell changes the stress triaxiality at the crack tip, thereby requiring more energy for continuation of the crack. So as you can imagine, we'll see improved toughness. And that's what I wanna show here. So the, the bars here 
or at 0% loading, and then you can see at 10% loading how it improves the toughness, the K1C, depending on the type of hardener that you're utilizing. So another good toughness improver with um, very easy shear mixing into the resin system. And the last one that, I, that we see is relevant out there are the uh, 3M nano silica or nano calcite products. I show a couple of SEM images so you can see how that's very well dispersed in the resin matrix for both the silica and the calcite. The nice thing here, it's a pre-blended resin system. So the customer doesn't have to worry about shear mixing. It's already pre-blended. And we see good improvements in both tensile modulus and toughness as well. So those are the four items that I just kind of wanted to give you a reference point for what we compare to when we evaluate new nanoparticles like graphene. But let me finish this presentation with a few slides talking about the um, graphene enhanced composites testing project that we're developing in coordination with the Graphene Council and UAMI. So our concept here is basically to offer a base slurry, a graphene enhanced epoxy that could then be marketed to the various formulators in North America. So at Composites One, we already have a strong relationship with many of these formulators because they're suppliers to us now. Now, the key thing to remember here is, as we're starting, we were starting to consider the concept for this, we didn't want to just develop a custom solution for, say, hockey sticks or a custom solution for filament winding, say. What we wanted to do is develop a, a base slurry that can then be let down into other systems. So why do we want to do that? Well, in our experience, formulators throughout the country thrive on their own custom design solutions for the market segments that they've grown to have success in. So they're not interested in relabeling a Me Too system. We don't want to sell them a finished epoxy formulation that they just simply slap their label onto, a Me Too system. But what we want to offer is a graphene enhanced base slurry that they can then use to expand upon in their own custom system formulation. And we believe this will be more enticing to them. So this allows a broad market approach and appeal by offering a physical property enhanced base epoxy that formulators can then let down into their custom systems and offer their market base. So in order to have that broad base system that could be applicable to all market segments, including structural and high glass transition temperature applications, we need to utilize a BIS-F system, a bisphenol F type system because it has the best physical properties in, inherent to it. And so for this, we chose the, the Huntsman GY282 BIS-F system. You see the chemical structure up there. This is a fairly well-known BIS-F system in the industry. Huntsman has good experience using this as well. So we're going to partner with Huntsman to provide this. Now you have to ask yourself, what kind of curative or hardener are we going to be utilizing in the system? And there's many hardener options to consider uh, for the use in the testing. And the hardener that we choose will have implications on both in-use process, whether it's filament winding or uh, pre-preg, as well as market segment. You know, you use a different type of hardener for structural applications for say aerospace than you do for simple adhesives. So for the broadest application that will allow for prediction of results to higher performance systems, we've decided on a dicey curative. This type of curative has broad applications, including everything from general layout processing uh, to adhesive formulations. Uh, the dicey also allows us to have a lot of control over blending in at an elevated temperature. So when we combine this hardener and BISF, we'll have already blended in the graphene that you send us in an elevated temperature environment, and DICE allows us to blend in that curative without having a, a, a very fast cure time. We could control the, the cure process as we elevate the temperature. So those are the systems we're going to use. I think it's important to understand how we're going to evaluate the graphene. What kind of testing are we going to do? And there's two groups we're going to utilize. So the first group of testing is just neat resin testing. These are three basic test methods that you see on most epoxy data sheets, um, tensile flexor modulus, flexural strength of modulus, and impact toughness. I've listed the ASTM test so that you guys can refer to them and understand how we'll be evaluating the graphene. And this is just in the neat resin. Now, we also wanted to step up and do laminate testing as well, because that's really where the rubber hits the road. We want to make sure that in the laminates that our customers use, what we see an improvement. So we tried to focus on matrix-driven properties, uh, the only exception being the tensile strength of modulus. That's just kind of a basic one that we could easily add in there. But the other four are typically matrix-driven properties. So we're doing compression strength of modulus, interlaminar shear strength of modulus, flex strength of modulus, as well as impact toughness. There's other testing that could be done, but we thought this would be a nice, well-rounded um, evaluation of the graphene. 
So the goal here, what we plan on doing, is as we get the graphene samples from you guys, they'll be sent to uh, UAMI in Utah. The testing will be done at the University of Utah there. And we'll evaluate all the products. We're then going to submit the reports back to everyone that's involved in an anonymous form. So you will not be able to know whose results are what, but you will see what your results are in comparison to others. And then we at Composites One, what we plan to do is look at the best performers. So for instance, you know, it's unlikely we'll have one graphene supplier outperform everybody in every single characteristic. But what we will see is, you know, one may really outshine an impact toughness. And then what we'll do is look at the market segments that really value impact toughness. We'll go to our formulators that are already well established in those particular market segments, and we'll then communicate to them what we've seen, the type, the type of improvements we see with it, and then we'll offer that base BISF slurry to them to take and then further enhance into their various customize functionalizations. And we'll do this industry by industry, market segment by market segment. And this should allow us to quickly, you know, get your product into the market segment and allow the formulators and end use customers to see those enhancements. So that's the basic overview of the concept of the testing project we're going to do. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Terrence. And I think he's going to offer up uh, an opening for questions after he talks a little bit longer. So Terrence, I'll turn it to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Jason. Appreciate that. So as we talk about this uh, testing project, as, as uh, Jason uh, really well described the project, we're trying to move along this adoption curve. And, and James, at the beginning of this presentation, talked about the Gartner hype curve. You know, we've seen how this evolves and now we're moving on to this, to this next section. Um, if we look at the composite supply chain, it is fairly complex that you have, you know, graphene producers and then you have graphene enhancement, which could be from the graphene producer or there are companies that simply source graphene in and they do functionalization or they enhance it in some other fashion. It then moves either into a resin system or we even have uh, carbon fiber or glass fiber companies that are looking at doing fiber sizing with graphene materials to enhance the fibers themselves, which is another route. We haven't really discussed that yet. And then you get into the next level where you've got compounders who are uh, preparing these solutions, distributors like Composites One, uh, prepreg material, which then will go to the composite part maker, um, which then either goes directly to an OEM, to the end user, or it gets embedded into a larger system as a component which then goes to the OEM. And so this is just one example of what that supply chain might look like. And it's important that along the way, each supply chain partner is gonna have different objectives and challenges. So with graphene, especially over the past years, the, the, the challenge of producing graphene at scale and consistently in quality, um, I would argue has been uh, greatly addressed, largely addressed by the leading graphene producing companies. Um, that's one of the biggest advancements that's happened over the past couple of years. And now we're into the tons and hundreds of tons and thousands of tons capacity for graphene material. So that obstacle of scale um, has largely been addressed. And then if you look at our next uh, stakeholders, uh, both whether it's in uh, resin and fibers or the compounders and the distributors, the biggest issue is the, the uh, disbursement of the material through the matrix. For the next stakeholders, for the parts makers, and for systems, if I'm making composite parts, and again, as Jason has alluded to, and we've said here a couple of times, the, the beautiful thing about using graphene and composites is that you really don't have specialist equipment or a, a, mass, a massive change to your processes. These would be uh, quite minimal issues. So graphene is an ideal uh, candidate for enhancing the performance of composites because of those aspects. It's, it's not a capital intensive change you have to make. It's simply understanding how to, how to work with the material in the existing systems you have. And then for the OEMs, which is really the driver, right? The, the, this is really the pull. So at the end of the day, if a Boeing or an Airbus or a Ford or whomever you wish to pick as a large end user company, if they don't see the benefit in having these enhanced performance parts, and to integrate them into the end product, then none of this is gonna happen. Uh, but they're not the ones directly doing the R&D in most cases, they depend on their tier one suppliers, those that are the parts makers and the systems uh, uh, assemblers um, to, to do this. And what they wanna know is, 
that will it perform as intended? And is that entire supply chain that, uh, that resides above this, is that robust enough that they can make it a standard de facto um, ingredient into their product? So I just wanted to highlight that to kind of visualize where some of the um, key, uh, key choke points are in this host system. And again, as the Graphene Council and why we're doing this webinar is we wanna pull these different stakeholders together and understand that we will all succeed if we can make this work for each one of us in this uh, supply chain. So the, just another way of looking at this is there will be companies that are online here today that have experience with uh, nanomaterial handling, for example, they may have used other nanomaterials and they may really understand what the end use application is, but if they don't understand the nuances that are involved with graphene materials in this uh, complex family of different types of graphene materials, then of course, that's not gonna work. And of course, we have uh, another iteration of this would be companies that understand graphene and other nanomaterial handling expertise, but they don't really fully understand the end user um, application and how it's gonna be used um, in the real world, then we have a disconnect there as well. And that's why it's absolutely critical that we all work together uh, collaboratively because the prize at the end of this for the companies that learn how to adopt and leverage what graphene has to offer is a competitive advantage in the marketplace to have products and applications that perform at a different level than the current status quo. And they can do it, uh, I'm convinced as well, in a very cost effective way, because in many cases using graphene, while it does add cost for the material itself, if you have faster processes, better processes, longer lasting product, you actually save money. And I wanna close by just talking about this graphene enhanced composites testing. Um, as Jason said, we're gonna be testing different materials and the way this works is if you are a graphene producing company and you want to participate, or if you are one of the uh, companies that actually sources graphene, but you do uh, functionalization or enhancement, and that's the product that you offer, you can, uh, you can participate in this project by submitting the material you want to be involved in the tests. And whether it's graphene oxide or a graphene nanoplatelet, or it's a few layer graphene material that's functionalized or not functionalized, we are gonna take the same approach with each one of these graphene materials that are gonna be shear mixed into the resin system exactly the same way. We are going to produce the test parts for each of those ASTM tests that were listed. And per sample that we receive, we are gonna conduct 360 different test coupons. And that means for each test, we will have six different pieces of test coupon per test so that we get a statistically relevant result. And then we'll be able to um, look at how this uh, graphene, these different graphene materials function, whether they're in a neat formulation with, uh, uh, um, with no reinforcement or if they're in a glass fiber reinforced or a carbon fiber reinforced. And we'll be using load factors of 1% load factor, half a percent, and one tenth of a percent of uh, graphene by weight into the matrix systems. And so if you want to learn more about that, there's a link there on the screen, or you can write to me directly. I'll be happy to give the complete fact sheet about how this project is going to run and what it means to participate. It is open to both graphene council member companies and non-member companies. Graphene Council member companies will enjoy a significant uh, financial advantage in terms of cost. Um, there is a cost affiliated with participating simply because if you consider um, the materials that we have to acquire, the test coupons that have to be made, the engineering time and the test equipment that has to be used to test 360 pieces per sample submitted, there are costs involved and so we need to cover those. Um, but it, we try to keep the cost um, as low as possible because we want to encourage comparison. And we think this will be extremely interesting information for the company that participates. You'll see how your material behaves and you'll be able to compare it head to head with other company material, not knowing who the companies are, but the general type of material that you're comparing against. And for the companies that are considering using composites and as uh, Jason said, from composites one own perspective, we want to see which type of material is going to perform best and which uh, type of application or uh, performance characteristic. And even if we don't have the perfect answer from this test, it will certainly move us forward in understanding how to put this into a commercial application.
So with that, I'm going to just give a, sh a short commercial about the Graphene Council, and then I want to go directly to the questions. Um, many of you on this call are members of the Graphene Council. Some of you are not members of the Graphene Council, and I just want to encourage you to consider joining. We have tremendous amount of resources. We've just published a Graphene report, which is the most comprehensive report in the market, period. It's over 600 pages. We cover production methodologies, characterization, market applications, market pricing, uh, industries, and we also cover 200 graphing producing companies that are reviewed in, in that report. So that's just one uh, report that we have. And then of course, uh, as membership, uh, you get that report as part of the corporate or university members. And then we also do a weekly graphing intelligence briefing. Um, so every week we report on commercial um, activities with graphene, research activities, and patents that are filed worldwide. So with that, now we're going to go to Q&A. So Jason and James, if you both can unmute yourselves so we can take the questions. I'm going to go to the, uh, the Q&A and the chat box to take questions. Um, I'll try to do these in order. Um, the first question that we have that's come up is, I'm not sure if we can achieve this or not, but the question is, I'd like to learn about graphene-based products that cannot be cut by power tools like reciprocating saw or cutting disc mounted on a grinder. I know graphene can make things tough, can it, but can it make things indestructible? <laughs> Probably you're looking more at carbon light, diamond light carbon. If you want something that's particularly hard, graphene per se is not necessarily hard. So you're probably in a different form of carbon is a simple answer. Right. Thank you, James. Um, another question comes about uh, is about costs. And I guess I'll take that one. The question is, what's the current average production cost of graphene nanoplatelets and reduced graphene oxide in North American and European markets? As I mentioned, we do have our graphene report where we break down the pricing. But let me answer the question this way. Um, Graphene, uh, if we talk about the bulk form of graphene, like graphene nanoplatelets, is made uh, primarily from a feedstock of graphite. Uh, graphite material is currently in the range of somewhere around $1,500 to $1,200 to $1,000 per ton. And so the question on cost really becomes one of um, how far down can you exfoliate this material? In other words, how few layers can you get to? What are the energy inputs to do that? Um, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. So, you know, that's the, that the question on what the actual um, cost is, is going to vary greatly. And then for graphene oxide, it's a different production method than let's say exfoliating graphene nanoplatelets from, from a graphite source. Um, and so the costs are going to vary quite a bit. You'll see that in the market, there's a very wide range, uh, could be as little as $50 for a kilo. So it's about $25 a pound into the thousands of dollars, depending on the exact material that you're talking about. So the challenge here is really finding the right material for the right application. And when you get down to the point where, for example, you, um, you can use a 10th of a percent by weight, um, what could be a high cost graphene material could still be quite economical for the application that you're, uh, that you're looking at. So let me get to some more uh, technical questions here that, um, that uh, maybe James can address or, or, uh, or Jason here. Um, one of the questions is, can we perform injection molding method on composites of graphene and a polymer like PLA to manufacture a product? And then also is graphene biocompatible? I'm well, gonna... biocompatible it depends on the on the manufacturing source as a simple statement um but being carbon carbon is, is is biocompatible arguably so a lot depends on your process of producing the graphene and how you mix it or what the product's in okay and uh jason did you want to talk anything about this you know injection molding um there's certainly use of graphene in injection molding now now the types of different plastics I can't speak to because I'm, I'm not as knowledgeable in that arena, but it certainly is utilized now in injection molding. Yeah. Yes, I confirm that. Yeah. yeah. Another question is, um, is there a good way to compatibilize graphene with certain polyolefins such as PE, PP that do not have any PI bonds? Do you have to use surfactants or dispersants? So that's, you know, a fairly technical question. Does anybody want to tackle that one? Um, on the thermoplastic side, again, I'm not as strong there, so I'll probably have to lean on 
anything James has to say. But again, um, apologies for me. If, if someone wants to pa pass that question and get somebody to try and answer. There has been a question here. There's a question about the current and future recycling of graphene that can be usable. And there's, there's a company I haven't yet mentioned on here called Nano Explore, which is one of our uh, graphene companies that have used graphene additives into plastics that have been recycled to extend their recyclability. There have been questions before, and, and James, I think maybe you might be able to answer this too. There have been questions about, you know, once you put graphene into some of these composites or into plastics, can it, can it be liberated again, right? Can you grind it out? And my understanding of the tests that have been done, because you're using so little of it and it's at such a small um, uh, dimension, that it becomes fully encapsulated and that it doesn't really uh, liberate from that host material. Now, in the case of Nano Explorer and the recycling of plastics, um, plastics can be recycled only so many times and then they don't have enough strength or other properties to make them usable material again. And what they've um, uh, demonstrated with their material, adding it to these uh, grade of plastics that no longer were recyclable, is because of strength improvements, they could be recycled at least again for another, another go round, which is a fantastic. Uh, situation because it diverts material that otherwise would have been just pure waste into usable material again. Yeah, so, so it's a very broad question, but as a simple principle, in, in reduction in plastics, you know, by adding graphene, potentially you can reduce the amount of plastic, you know, to get the equivalent performance or strength is, is one area of potential uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. Another area is looking at alternative materials, a biomass material as an example. By adding graphene, can you use that as an alternative to plastic is, is one solution um, being looked at uh, around recycling. And then a third one, which you touched on there, Terence, I'll give an example of rubber. Yeah, there's a few examples where people are adding graphene into rubber. And again, depends on the formulation. It's generally encapsulated. But for example, there is a company that's taking um, um, chopped up tires and by addition of, of, of a small amount of fresh rubber and graphene, they can get back to close to the original performance. So it makes it more recyclable, more reusable. Um, and then you can chop that up and you can keep recycling that. So increasingly, there's a number of examples where graphene is playing into the whole sustainability agenda. Um, but it's a broad question. You need to understand what type of graphene, how it's formulated, how it's mixed. But yeah, a number of cases where graphene is now being looked at on the whole environmental and sustainability type agenda. Absolutely. Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions regarding to dispersion. You know, how do we um, how do we achieve a high level of dispersion of graphene in a polymer matrix during processing? You know, is the best app option to add as a master batch? You know, what is what are some of the best approaches there? So either for a, a polymer or or like PLA in, in, in those type of um, applications. I'll just jump in here for composites one and say for this testing, how we're going to disperse it is we're going to do an elevated temperature shear mix. The BISF base, we're going to blend in the graphene at an elevated temperature. Uh, we haven't completely defined the temperature and the duration because we had ideas for it. And then once we consulted with Huntsman, we found they had a number of experiences with it. So we're going to possibly modify it somewhat. But the one thing that will be certain is that we're going to have the same process across the batches that we utilize. So let's say, for instance, we take the BISF up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, we shear mix it for a given amount of time, and then once we you know, hit that time duration, we'll then blend in the dicey curative. The nice thing about the dicey is it doesn't start to go off until you heat it even further. So we'll have a good thorough mixing of the graphene and the dicey in there, and it'll all be done at an elevated temperature. Those um, actual numbers will be defined and decided on here shortly, and it'll be shown on that website that uh, Terrence had mentioned. But for in our experience, it's best to blend. Uh, it's great if you don't require elevated temperature, but elevated temperature always does a better job of dispersing it. Uh, we've done it with both solvent-based and um, pellet types. The pellet types are, you know, typically require longer stirring time and, and do require elevated temperatures, but um, it's certainly what we found in, in, in our experience. Excellent. Thanks, Jason. For me, just a, a general comment, uh, maybe Terence, to answer a number of the general questions. For, for me, uh, before answering a specific question, it's very important to understand, A, what are you trying to achieve? You know, is it mechanical strength improvement? Is it thermal management properties? 
is it um, a multifunctional um, foam or a composite or a rubber? So, so first of all, from all the questions is what are you trying to achieve? What is the benefit or the performance improvement you're looking at? And then based on that, there is probably an optimum form of graphene or graphenes, different types of graphene, a different formulation method and a process that could be undertaken to achieve that. And that involves you know, quite a bit of know-how and, and uh, an understanding. Um, what I would say, though, is increasingly you're finding people who are doing that. We've given a number of examples in the presentation who are doing that consistently, uniformly to a, to a recipe or a standard. So I, I think there is no one graphene. There is no one single process. There's an awful amount of know-how. For me, um, talk, Jason talked about it earlier. You need to understand all those manufacturing type processes as well as the technology processes to get this right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't want to give everybody the impression that this is some magic black box and it's so complicated it's not uh, solvable, right? But there are a lot of nuances with the different types of materials. And if you look at just the different iterations of lateral flake size, layer count, functionalized, non-functionalized, et cetera, there are a lot of different formats um, of this material and they all behave slightly differently. What's really important where we have seen successful applications is where Graphene producers and end users and intermediaries all work together and so that you can tune the material to what your application is. Just going back to this testing program that we're kicking off, one of the, one of the questions was, is when will this composites testing project start and when, you know, where can I find more information? I will send you a slide and with a link that will describe how to participate and where you can actually register if you want to participate in the project. We are ready to start. This is the first announcement. We're kicking off the project as of today. And so over the next, I would say 30 days, we'll accept applications. We'll have to cut it off at some point if we get too many companies that are participating. But we can go ahead, even though some of the labs have been closed because of COVID-19, we are still able to go ahead and produce the parts. So there is work that we can do to prepare the test coupons, which is uh, quite a bit, a bit of work in itself. But we'll, we'll, uh, we're kicking off today and so that this is open uh, as of today and I'll send information for those who have interest in that where you can uh, find out more about how to participate. The other, uh, other thing, we have a couple questions, you know, if, if somebody wants more information, do they contact Jason directly? How do we do this? Um, the contact information for Jason will be on his slides. You can definitely reach out to him directly. You can reach out to James. Um, one of the, the great benefits of the Graphene Council working together with uh, Manchester and the Geek is that we both see many different broad requirements come in through from end users. So, you know, a lot of folks make the trip to uh, Manchester to look at the facility to talk to the experts within the Graphene Council. We have companies contacting us all the time. You know, I'd like to use graphene in this method. What type of material do I need? And our role as the Graphene Council has been to connect you know, the producers with these end users to get to solutions. So if you have questions, if we can't answer them for you directly, we can probably direct you to the right people. So feel free to reach out to myself and to the Graphene Council. Obviously, we encourage you to join um, to take advantage of the network we have, but we literally reach about 25,000 material scientists across the globe, both in the academic and in the commercial world. There is not a larger, more connected community for people who are working on graphene and we encourage you to take advantage of that so that we can accelerate the development of this into a commercial application um, in years rather than decades. So I don't know if you have any closing comments. We have a few more questions, but I, I think we've covered um, some of this information. Some of it's gonna be very technical or very specific. Everyone's gonna get a copy of a link to the recorded session. You're gonna get a copy of the slides. Um, feel free to reach out to the Graphene Council. We also have links. If you have a specific requirement and you want to describe and say, I'm looking at improving this particular application and I'd like to know if Graphene can help me with impact resistance or strength or light weighting or whatever the case is, I will be sending you a link for that online form where you can submit your requirement. And those requirements can be submitted anonymously so that only the Graphene Council is aware of the party asking or they can be made public and we can distribute those publicly to our graphene producers to get in touch with you to find a solution. So I'll give you all this information and in follow up uh, in a follow up email. 
And with that, James, did you did you have any uh, closing comments you want to share with our audience today? Yeah, probably just as a closing statement, particularly in these challenging times, you know, now is a good time to engage, to answer your questions around not just graphene, but how advanced materials might improve your product or, or application. And again, a, a slight plug in addition to the Graphene Council, if you go to the University of Manchester website, um, Graphene of Manchester will be running a series of, of seminars over the next weeks. You know, again, you know, targeting at different sectors, if that's of interest to anybody. So to engage, I think it's an opportunity that Graphene is starting to make an impact. You know, there are people on this call who can make graphene by the gram, by the kilo, by the ton. They can make it an affordable price, um, a more affordable price. So I think it is a good time to be engaging around your business and your application. I'm sure there's many people around this call who'd be pleased to talk to you or engage either in Manchester, the Graphene Council, or in the supply chain. So thank you for inviting us, Terence, and the opportunity. Um, but I think it's a good a good time for people to be understanding how graphene might support their, their business, their application or their industry. Excellent. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. You know, we really value the relationship. Certainly encourage people to take part in the webinars that you've got coming up. I know you have a whole series of them and that's going to be great. Um, another really good source of information for everyone. And Jason, how about you? Any last words for our audience today? I just want to thank you for um, involving us and allowing us to be a part of this. I do want to just communicate the general overview that we see ourselves positioned as a good overall solutions provider, especially when it comes to nanoparticles and graphene. So if you have needs, you have particular problems you want us to you know, help hold your hand through and, and work with you side by side, feel free to reach out to me and we'll get the appropriate people involved at Composites One. So thank you, Terrence. Yeah, absolute pleasure. I, th I think you guys are in a unique position because you do see so many use end user applications. You, you really are in a unique position to provide advice and guidance because you know, you've seen it in, in so many instances in working with your customers. So with that, from the Graphene Council, I want to thank our speakers and I want to thank you, our audience, for tuning in for this webinar today. We hope it was informative to you and we hope you'll take advantage of the network that the Graphene Council represents to help advance your business and your research in using graphene for applications. Thank you so much. And especially today with COVID-19, we hope everybody stays safe, stays healthy, and stays home, at least for another week or two. Take care.